Praise God. What a wonderful song uh, at the cross. And it's, it's perfect because we are uh, partaking of communion today instead of last week. Many of us were gone at the family camp. By the way, praise God for the family camp. Uh, there were many of us who came. Yes. Uh, who, who are the people who, came, who went to family camp? Let me, let me hear you. Yeah? All right. That was a that was a good camp. A lot of little kids, a lot of couples uh, learning about how to communicate. Uh, for me, I, I was able to catch a fish, so I was uh, happy. A big fish, yes. My mistake was uh, when I was praying, I said, uh, Lord, I want to catch at least, uh, well, what was your goal in camp? They, they were asking, what's your goal in camp? And I was talking to my wife, and I said, I wanna, my goal is to catch a fish. And that was my mistake. I said, a fish. <laughs> so after I caught one, that was it. I didn't catch any more. <laughs> but praise God. It's good to be back. Thank, uh, praise God for Pastor Eric, who gave such a powerful message on raising uh, godly kids in a hostile world. So we praise the Lord for that. Um, but today, what we're doing is we're restarting the book of Daniel. Remember Daniel? Uh, we... Uh, started at uh, the beginning of the year. We had a lot of skits uh, on it, and uh, this time we're, we're, we're gonna not we're not gonna do the skits because it's gonna be very difficult because it's actually uh, prophecy, a biblical prophecy that we will look at. But we do have booklets available. If, if you'd like to have one, uh, raise your hand. They have it, they have it available. Um, our, just the overview. It's just the visions of Daniel. Many different visions. Today, the, the four beasts, uh, next week, the ram and the goat, uh, following that, the 77s, uh, vision of the heavenly messenger, Israel's history, and Israel's deliverance, Lord willing. So six messages on future things. Uh, the, the place that this, these visions occur is, of course, in Babylon. Uh, let me put this away. It's, I don't want to trip on it. It's Babylon, uh, the... Southern Kingdom was captured in 538 B.C., and, and they were captured and brought to Babylon, where Daniel and his friends were. If you remember, the first half was narrative or stories about how they were able to survive in this pagan culture. Uh, Daniel and his friends uh, refused to eat the food that the king uh, provided and they were healthier than, than any of the other uh, other uh, trainees to be part of the the council or to be part of the the king's court and God blessed them as a result of their obedience. Uh, we also see God uh, protecting them from angry kings and jealous um, co co regents or not co regents but those who were in power. Uh, God protected them from the, from the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God protected Daniel from the, the lion, in the lion's den. And so we, we see these individual stories of how God was sovereign over the lives of these young men. And throughout, throughout this, this journey, as we see from Daniel 1 to 6, Daniel received visions. And what he did, instead of putting it in chronological order... He put all the visions together that he received throughout his life, and he puts it at the end of the book. Uh, the, so instead of narratives, now as we study chapter 7 to chapter 12, we have what's called apocalyptic literature. No longer stories, but a revelation concerning the future. And when we say apocalyptic, uh, it means there are some catastrophic events, some dreadful events that happen. The book of Revelation in, in the New Testament is an apocalyptic literature. And many times when I ask people, what do you want to study? You want to study revelations. You want to study about the future, the end times. Well, that's what Daniel is. In fact, chapter 7, the, the chapter that we'll study, is one of the most extended view of what happens from the time of Daniel to the time that Jesus Christ comes back. So it's, it's no longer narrative. It's now apocalyptic. It's no, no, it's no longer narrated in the third person. Daniel was telling stories now it's narrated from a first-person narrative. It says, I receive these visions, instead of him telling a story. And instead of Daniel being the one to interpret the dreams of kings, now he is the one asking for interpretation. These visions were so fantastic, were so amazing, that he didn't understand them. And so he asked, 
help me? What does this mean? So from narrative to apocalyptic, and he, he from third person to now uh, first person needing an interpreter. But the times that he talks about are the times from the from Babylon, the time that the, the, the people were the people of God were taken to Babylon, all the way to the time of the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is what's called the Jesus calls it the time of the Gentiles in, in Luke chapter 24 during the Olivet Discourse. He calls this the time of the Gentiles. Why does he call it that? Because after Israel was taken away, after the last king was deposed in the southern kingdom, there has, no, there has not been a king, who, a Jewish king, who has sat on the throne of David. And there will not be one until Jesus Christ comes again. And so here you, you, you find Daniel talking about this panoramic view of what happens from the time they were in Babylon all the way to the time when Jesus comes again. And we get an overview of this in Daniel chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 28. Uh, that, that is inscription at the bottom is wrong. It should be Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 28. But before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for an opportunity to study your word. We thank you that this is made possible because of the sacrifice of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is at the cross where love and justice met. And we thank you that we're recipient of that work. We are recipient of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that as we once again look into your word, that you would speak to us in a special way for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus was still here on earth, he gave an extended sermon called, this, um, called the, the Upper Room Discourse. There were three, the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse, and the third one is the Upper Room Discourse found from John chapter 13 all the way to John chapter 16. But it was in this sermon, this discourse, this uh, teaching to the disciples that he tries to comfort them because he had just given them revelation of what was to happen to him, that he was going to be taken away. One of them is a traitor. They would all fall away, and they were very disturbed. And so he, he talks to them, and he, he tells them at the end, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. I didn't tell this to you to disturb you. I told this to you so that you could have peace. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. You will have problems in this world. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Earlier in this sermon, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus says, in this, in this world, you'll have tribulations. In this world, you'll have problems. But I've said these things so that in me, you might have peace. So that in me, you could be assured of victory over the things that trouble you. Even great men of God are sometimes tempted to be troubled. Are sometimes tempted to be afraid. In our text, Daniel was troubled. Daniel was perplexed. Daniel was anxious because of these great revelations that we will study that was revealed to him. It says in Daniel 7.15 in the NIV, I, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. He was anxious. And the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. Even great men are sometimes troubled by things that will come up. Let me ask you, what is it that troubles you this morning? As you came through the door, as you were singing the songs that we were led in, what is it that was troubling you? Maybe some of you are troubled about bills. Uh, where do I get the next payment for my car, for my house? Uh, where, where do I get the funds from? Maybe some of you are worried about work. Uh, they're laying off people. I'm not sure if I will be one of the ones laid off. Maybe you're worried about your children or you're troubled about your children. Some of them may be walking far from the Lord or they're messing up in school or they're in trouble with the law. And 
You, you don't quite know what to do anymore with your child. Maybe some of you are troubled about your health. Maybe your last checkup, the doctors gave you some disturbing news and you're troubled by it. The lesson for Daniel is the same lesson for us this morning, and it's this. The God who controls the history of the world controls the history of our lives. We can trust our tomorrow to the God who holds tomorrow. In this passage, you find that God is sovereign over everything that happens in this world. And we know that he is sovereign over everything that happens in our lives. Amen. And that, that is the story or that is the, the, the message of this whole six chapters. The God who is sovereign over everything, who is sovereign over kings and kingdoms, is sovereign over our lives. We see his sovereignty marvelously displayed in this passage. Uh, three movements in this passage that will encourage us to cast all our cares upon the one who is sovereign. Three things. First of all, you see the rise of empires. The rise of empire. God has determined the panoramic rise and fall of kings and kingdoms. And he reveals to Daniel what is to come. In verse 1, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, so this happens before chapter 5, says, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. This is the end of his first person narrative, now he, or third person narrative. Now he's going to go into the first person. It says in verse 2, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The winds of heaven could refer to God's power or angelic beings that he commands. And whenever the Old Testament talks about the Great Sea, or the Bible talks about the Great Sea, it speaks of the Mediterranean Sea. So it's speaking of events that happen around that area. Verse 3, And four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. Verse 4, And he begins to describe the, the, these beasts that he saw. Now imagine with him, as you see these beasts that are like beast that we see on earth, but really it's just, he's just using human words to describe something fantastic. And so keep that in mind as I show you artist's depiction of what these things might look like. It says, the first was like a lion in eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. So a, a, an artist's de depiction of it, it's a lion with wings. It had eagle's wings. And then it was, the, the wings were plucked later. And it was lifted up from the earth and it was, the man's heart was given. Now wh what is this referring to? Well, if you recall... King Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. And, and by the way, this is, uh, you could see this in the Louvre. A lot of you came from Europe. But if you go to the Louvre, this is the, this was what's taken from the gate of Ishtar. And Babylon, many times, they represented themselves as a lion with eagle's wings. And so it's definitely talking about Babylon. But what does it mean that his wings were plucked off? Well, when Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind, he, he was, not, he was not, not a king uh, for seven years. It was seven years before God gave him back his sanity, if you recall that from our story. And then he was, he was humbled, and he was, again, lifted up, and God gave him a change of heart. So I, I, I feel that this is what Daniel is speaking of. But then he sees another beast, the one coming after Babylon, another empire. It says, and behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. So this is a, an empire that would destroy many people, that will kill many people. And again, another artistic depiction of it. It's a bear with, with one side that, that's raised up with three ribs in its mouth. It could refer to surrounding nations that it conquered before it became a world power. 
And it was told to arise and devour much flesh. So it killed many on its, its path to dominance. Then I looked, and another was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. The, the, the third one looked like a leopard with four heads. Leopard is one of the, the fastest animals on earth. And it had four wings, uh, and it was given dominion. It was another empire that came after the bear. And the fourth is the strangest of all. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, the fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left in its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now imagine, he's trying to describe in human words what, what he saw. It could look something like this, or maybe even, but maybe totally different. We don't know. But it was a beast, again, came out of the sea, ten horns, iron teeth, brass nails, a little horn which plucked its three horns. And so it, it, another, another part of this beast, is something happened to it. It says in verse 8, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots and behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Uh, again, I, I saw an artistic depiction that the beast that had horns, all of a sudden one that had eyes and mouth and, and three of the horns around it were plucked out. Oh, gruesome, gruesome pictures. Now, how would you feel if you were Daniel? If you saw these visions and, and you saw, saw these amazing beasts that could hardly be described, how would you feel? you feel confused because from his vantage point, these are all future things. Now, we have the advantage of seeing the fulfillment of most of these prophecies. So for us, we could look at history and say, oh, that's what happened. For Daniel, this was all new. This was all looking ahead. Now, when you're reading scripture, sometimes you go, well, how do I apply this, pastor? And you ever read the Bible and you're going, okay, what do I get out of this? Your morning devotion, you have reading about all these beasts. Okay, so what could I take with me as I go to work? <laughs> what is the encouragement here? Well, for me, knowing that these are the kingdoms of the world, you know how it encourages me? It encourages me knowing that God is in control of history. That nothing surprises him. He's not shocked by world events. He's not shocked by who won the last election. He's not shocked by anything or the election before that. And so you, 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 you begin to see that, that God, God sits on the throne and that he allows these kingdoms to occur. And, and he's the one who, who orchestrates the movements of empires. Now, when you see God in that light, you understand that, the, that God is eternal. He's been to the future and back. And so he could tell you what's coming up. And if he could tell you what's coming up in the events of the world, he could certainly, he could certainly tell you or he could certainly comfort you concerning your life. Concerning what's troubling you. Concerning your tomorrow. Why? Because God's been there. He knows what's there. And guess what? He's there with you. And so for me, as, as I read this, it is, it is an affirmation. It is, it is a comfort that nothing surprises God. That that news that you receive from your work, that news you receive about your son, that, that news you receive about your health, nothing surprises God. He knows what's in the future. And so we could entrust ourselves to the God who, who knows the future. We could cast our cares on the one who, who rules over all, who is sovereign over all. And that's why when Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, he's speaking from the vantage point of a person who's eternal, who knows not only what's going to happen that night when he's arrested, he knows what will happen the third day when he would rise again. And so his message to us is, don't let your hearts be troubled. You know, the rise of kings shows you that God is in control. 
And just to, to make sure that you know that, guess what? You see not only the rise of kingdoms, you see the reign of God. You see the reign of God. Daniel sees God sitting on the throne of heaven. In verse 9, it says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Isn't that comforting to know that, that God is sitting on the throne? That, that God is not pacing up and down going, Oh, man, what am I going to do about you know, that situation? What am I going to do about that bill? What am I going to do about that, that health situation? What am I going to do about that country and, that, and that, uh, that election? God is not pacing up and down in heaven. According to this, God is what? Sitting on the throne. Which means what? He's in total control. He's in control of what's happening in the world. He's in control of what's happening in your life and in my life. It says his clothes was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Gives you the vision of, that Ezekiel had. It says in verse 10, a stream of fire issued, came out before him. A thousand thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And the court sat in judgment and the books were open. So here you, you find the host of heaven worshiping God. That the response whenever we see chaotic situation in the world and chaotic situation in our lives is not to worry but to worship. We approach the throne of God understanding who he is, that he is in control. Here you find books were opened before him and, and he is the one who will judge these nations. As terrible and as cruel as these nations were, Eventually, God will be the one to judge them. Verse 11. I looked then because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, going back to this, who is this horn? Who is this little horn? It says, and as I looked, the beast was killed. So from, from a little horn, it grew and it became a beast. But guess what? In the end, it was defeated. And its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. But their lives were prolonged for the season and the time. And so the, the time of the Gentiles came to an end. When Jesus, com when Jesus comes again, he will rule and reign. And the time of the Gentiles will be no more. When it talks about the other beast and their, their lives are prolonged, it could be talking about their culture, that as one beast takes over the next, that the culture of the others were, were assimilated into that, into that new kingdom. Verse 13, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of the heaven, there came one like a son of man. So he saw the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, but then he, he sees another figure, it, which is the son of man. Do you know that this is one of the favorite phrases in the New Testament to describe the Messiah, to describe Jesus Christ? The Son of Man. And so he, he sees a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only of God the Father, he sees the picture of God the Son. It says, one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. In verse 14, and to him, I notice what happened, and, and, and I believe that the, this, what he was seeing is the presentation after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because notice what happens in verse 14. It says, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Unlike the kingdoms of men which came, which, which rose and fell, and which ended. The dominion and the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will go on forever and ever. When Jesus was born, this was the description of Gabriel to Mary. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever his kingdom will never end. Here in this passage, you find Daniel being reassured that as terrible as these beasts were, as terrible as the little horn which became 
a, a beast that defied God is. One of these days, he says, those kingdoms will end. Jesus Christ will come. And his kingdom not, will not only prevail, his kingdom will go on forever and ever. How do we apply that? I think for me, again, it's an encouragement that one of these days, Jesus will come. And one of these days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. One of these days, everything wrong will be made right. One of these days, all the things that trouble us will forever be in the past. Amen. That is the coming. That is the, that is the hope that is the encouragement that we have as Christians. That whatever problems we have, they're temporary. That one of these days, Jesus will come again. One of these days, he will rule and reign over everyone on earth. And so you have the, the reign of God. Finally, you find the request of Daniel. You have the rise of kingdoms. You have the, the rule of God. Finally, you have the request of Daniel. You can imagine Daniel looking looking at this, going, Lord, what does this mean? And this is interesting because in the past, kings would ask Daniel, what do, what do my dreams mean? And Daniel would interpret for them. But this time, Daniel didn't know. And so he asked two questions. First of all, he asked, what are those four kingdoms? Or what are those four beasts? Secondly, he asked, who is that little horn? Or what, that, that fourth beast is different. And so an angel we don't know if it's an angel, if the Lord himself, it just says he asked somebody that was there, interprets it for him. It says in verse 15, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious or troubled or disturbed, and the vision in my head alarmed me. Verse 16, I approached one of those who stood there, and I asked him the truth concerning all of this. So probably an angel. He says, So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of, of the things. I saw this amazing vision of four beasts. He goes, now, please help me. I don't, I don't understand. What does that mean? Here's the answer. These four beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Now, going back to the vision of King Nebuchadnezzar, remember that? This dream? He dreamed that there was a statue. The statue had a gold head, chest and arms of silver, Belly and thigh made out of brass, legs of iron, feet mixed with iron and clay, and then a rock cut without hands. We said the interpretation of that way back, you know, several months ago, was that the head of gold was the Babylonian Empire. Remember, Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar, you, you are that head. The chest of arms and silver, now we have the benefit of looking back over history. The next empire that rose was the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, the Persian Empire was always greater. Later, later on, it was just the Persian Empire. The belly and thigh of brass, we, I believe, is the Greek Empire, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, the, the feet mixed with iron, and, or the legs of iron is the Roman Empire. I believe that fourth kingdom has a dual, dual fulfillment. And I'll tell you why later on. And so the Roman Empire and then the revived Roman Empire are the feet mixed with iron and clay. And then finally, the rock cut without hands, of course, is Christ's kingdom. And so in this fourth kingdom, I believe that there's a dual fulfillment of it. And I'll explain to you why later on. So going back to Daniel's vision, it's the same vision that Nebuchadnezzar had had, except instead of a statue, now he sees animals representing the parts of the statue. For the head of gold, which was Babylon, he sees, of course, the lion with wings. For the arms, for the chest with arms folded, uh, it represents the Medo-Persian Empire, which later on become, becomes just the Persian Empire. That's why one of its shoulders is higher. The thighs represent, is represented by the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Why four heads? So Alexander the Great, he conquered the known world all the way to India in such a short time. It was amazing. He actually cried when there was no more kingdom to conquer. But he, he, he was such a, an amazing, 
an amazing military commander. But he died at a relatively young age, and he had four, he had four generals who were under him. And these four generals, we know from history, divided up his kingdom into four different parts, uh, north, south, east, west. That's why I believe that he has the four heads. Now, the beast is represented not only by the legs, but also by the feet. That's why I believe that there's two fulfillment of it. When Jesus came the first time, it was under Rome. If you remember, when Jesus was asked, should we pay taxes or not? What did he say? Well, give me a coin. Whose inscription is on that coin? They said Caesar. So he gave. So he said what? Give to God. Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. So he was under the Roman rule. But when Jesus first came, he didn't come as a king. He came as a baby. He didn't come as a lion, the lion of Judah. He came as a lamb. But the next time Jesus comes, he will come as a ruling king. So that's why I believe that the Roman Empire will once again be revived. Because it is the description of that little horn. That Jesus, that it's in that context that Jesus will come and will defeat that little horn, that beast. And I believe that that little horn is is none other than the the Antichrist. And we'll see that in Revelation. I'll show you after after this picture of what happened. And so what was a statue he sees as different animals going down a span of more than 500 years. So from the time that the, the... the nation of Israel or the southern kingdom was taken to Babylon, all the way to the time of Jesus Christ, there was 500 years where these different empires became became prominent. Okay, I hope hope I haven't lost you. Okay, stay with me. Um, But notice what happens in verse 18. Daniel sees that as these kingdoms were, were arising, Daniel sees again and again that it is God who's in control and it's God that will be victorious. In verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. So going back to to this, so four kingdoms, at the end, it will be the saints, it will be God's people that will have a kingdom ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Following me so far? Okay, verse 19. He has a second question. He goes, okay, can I, can I ask a second question? The first question, what are these four, four things? He says, oh, it's the kingdoms, the kings that will arise. His second question, could you tell me more about the fourth beast? Because it was so different. And so in verse 19, then I decided to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. So it was not only terrifying, there was something happening with the horns. Daniel, could you, could you explain that to me? And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. And so it gives you a little bit more detail that this horn actually persecuted God's people. Verse 22. 22, until the Ancient of Days came, and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So this little horn becomes great, exalts himself, opposes God, persecutes the saints, until God puts an end to his reign. Verse 23, thus he said, so this is the answer. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth, trample it down, and break it to pieces. So this this fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, which I believe later on, still in the future, we will have a revived Roman empire, which will rule the earth, headed by the Antichrist. It says in verse 24, as for the ten horns out of his kingdom... Ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down the three kings. After Rome broke apart in the 5th century A.D., 
the Roman Empire split up into what is today modern Europe. It split up into all these nations, all the nations that you see in Europe. It came from the Roman Empire. It seems like according to this, that one of these days, those empires or those nations will once again gather together. And you see that in the fact that the, the European Union, where they have you know, the euro and they're part of one, one economy, it seems like that's slowly being fulfilled uh, in, in Daniel. And so it says in verse 20, in 24, that it shall rise and it will rule over the world. Now, people sometimes ask me, well, pastors, the United States anywhere in, in prophecy? Well, at least in this prophecy, I don't see any, any reference to the United States. So I think this is referring to the revived Roman Empire. Okay, we'll t- talk more about details in, in, the, in the future. But notice in Revelations... Jesus came, he, he was born, he, he went up. Uh, the last book in the Bible, Revelation, now John is looking backwards. He's looking at the fulfillment of what Daniel has said. And he says there is yet a future fulfillment of what Daniel was talking about. Notice in Revelation 13, it talks about the Antichrist. It says, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Now, notice again, ten horns, originally, and seven heads with ten diadems on his horns and blasphemous names on his head. So definitely a, a kingdom that opposes God. And definitely instead of ten, because the Antichrist was able to demonstrate his power by defeating the three kings, all of a sudden it has seven heads. Verse 2, this is so fascinating. It says in verse 2, And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Do you notice something about the order? It's what? It's backwards. Why? Because from Daniel's perspective, he was looking into the future. That's why he says lion, bear, leopard. But from John's perspective... He was looking backwards. He was looking at history. That's why he says what? Leopard, bear, and lion. What does that mean? It means that this revived Roman Empire, this revived kingdom that the Antichrist will will rule, will have a lot of the characteristics of the former empire. And so here, John was again saying, you know, in the future, there will be a fulfillment of this prophecy. So in Daniel 7, 25, it says, He shall speak words against the Most High. This is the Antichrist. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. In other words, he will persecute those who would put their faith in Jesus as Savior. And he shall think to change the times and the law. And there shall be given into his hands for a time, times a half a time. What's that talking about? We'll talk about, we'll talk about that in the Daniel 70 weeks. Uh, that simply means three and a half years. What is that referring to? Stay tuned. We'll talk about that. Uh, two weeks from now. It says, But the court shall sit in judgment, and its dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. What is the bottom line? Every time he sees visions, every time he asks for interpretation, it always ends the same, which is what? That in the end, God will win. In the end, God will be victorious. Verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So the ones that the Antichrist persecuted, guess what? In the end, they will win. In the end, they will rule. It says, His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions shall serve and obey Him. What is it that we get from this passage? That whatever problems, whatever trials you have, understand That the God who controls the universe, the God who controls kings and kingdoms and the rise and fall of empires, guess what? He can take care of you. He's in control of your life. He has the power. He has the power to give you victory. Whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that's troubling you, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also. We serve a God who's in control of our lives. Whatever you're going through, 
you could cast all your cares upon him. Why is that? Because he cares for you. Revelations eleven fifteen, and let me just end with this verse. Let's read it together. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. The kingdom of the world. As, as Daniel was looking forward, as John was looking backwards and looking at a little bit of what would happen at the very end, the Bible assures us that the time of the Gentiles will soon end. That the time of the Gentiles will not be forever. There is a time when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Let me ask you this. When that time comes, where will you be? Will you reign with him? Or will you be outside the kingdom? The only way to be in the kingdom is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We've seen the rise of the empires, the reign of God, the request of Daniel. And what we learn is this, that we need to trust God, the God who is sovereign over kingdoms for the things that trouble us. If God is sovereign over kingdoms, he's certainly sovereign over the things that are going on in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for we serve a God who is all-powerful, a God who is all-wise. But most of all, Lord, we thank you today that we serve a God who is all-loving. We thank you that it's because of your great love for us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We thank you that it's because of his great love that we could celebrate communion today as a reminder of the covenant that we have with him when we put our faith and trust in his finished work on the cross. Father, I pray for anyone here who, who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior that even today, Lord, you would save them. And so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if today you've come and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come to him right now. In the quietness of this moment, just pray this prayer with me. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I here and now put my faith and trust in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer. Pray, Father, that you would just uh, help them to grow in their faith in you. If you're a believer and, and you've, you've come to church with heavy burdens, would you just cast that upon the Lord right now? The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so in the quietness of this moment, we, before we partake of communion, would you just do just that? Just say, Lord, I, Lord, I, I give you my problems, Lord. I don't know what to do with them, but Father, you do. Even before I ask, Lord, you know. So Father, I'm casting to you all my cares right now. I'm thanking you for the peace that you offer. I'm thanking you for the joy that you offer. I'm thanking you for the salvation that you give freely. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. Father, you know the hearts of your people, and I pray, Father, that you would just comfort them. As we partake of communion, that, Father, you would give us hearts that are grateful, that are rejoicing in your finished work for us on the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll part-